Hi, I'm Meta Spencer, and uh, today I think we want to talk about uh, pandemics and uh, epidemiology. This is one of our topics, you know, Pro Project Save the World has one of its projects is to do what we can to reduce the probability and the frequency and the severity of pandemics. So we go to somebody who's really an expert on this, and this is Dr. Prabhat Jha who is a physician and a professor at, at the University of Toronto's Dalalana School uh, of, uh, of Health. He's a specialist in global health and he's an epidemiologist. And uh, he does an amazing variety of different things. He, the, the, I think I, I checked you on Wikipedia and it showed a whole bunch of different diseases. So I get to to choose my favorite disease of the of the day, I suppose, and you you've got so many. I have a lot of options. Hi, <laughs> it's good to see you again. Good to see you, man. About uh, five years ago, um, or maybe a little less, you gave a talk at Science for Peace, which I was then sort of running, and um, and uh, you talked about this amazing study that you were doing in India about premature deaths. And uh, I thought it was so fascinating. It wasn't complete at the time. You were making your discoveries still. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, start off by getting uh, updated on uh, what you found in this, or how you went about it, and what you found in this uh, research. Uh, sure, happy to chat about uh... Uh, about what we've learned out of India. So, but uh, the starting point, I think, is uh, with a really simple problem that the world still has, which is that we have about 60 million deaths a year in the world. Most of those are in low and middle income countries, including 10 million a year in India. But for the vast majority of those deaths, we simply do not know what were the causes of death? We don't know whether a person died from tuberculosis or malaria or a heart attack or stroke. And this has uh, really come very, very uh, blatantly uh, uh, visible during the COVID pandemic. Because as we saw worldwide, there was a huge excess in deaths, even in the places like in Canada that measure deaths well. But in large parts of the world, particularly in India and in Africa, uh, there was uh, not enough information on how much uh, to the extent to which COVID is killing people uh, because the underlying problems were there that simply deaths weren't being adequately reported. So the, the starting problem is a very simple one. Most deaths in low and middle income countries still occur at home and without medical attention. And the systems that are used to record deaths, which is we take for granted here in Canada, if a death occurs in Canada, it's typically in a nursing home or in a hospital, or even if it's a home, the coroner will come and investigate the cause of death and issue a report. Um, but And in hospital, of course, you have medical records and medical attention to be able to fill out an information, um, uh, the World Health Organization or WHO standard medical cause of death form. Uh, it's completed you know, widely in Canada and has been for the last uh, roughly 50 years. But that simple recording is what is absent in many parts of the world. And this is why we have uncertainties even today in the 21st century on the extent to which COVID killed in Africa in particular. And we have controversies about how COVID killed in India. Our research using partially the million death study data, but also polling people all over the country in India showed there were 3 million COVID deaths or excess deaths from COVID in uh, 2021 and 2020. The government of India's official number is 400,000. So there's a sevenfold difference in the estimates that we have come up with and the Indian government officially sticks by. Uh, and this was hugely controversial, but um, you know, I think we're obviously 
obviously, I think we're right because we've done the science very carefully. Okay, now let me, I, I haven't been mentally counting these things. Now you say 3 million excess deaths of, from COVID in India. Yep. And you say 60 million people a year die, period, someplace. Um, now, how many, uh, I think I saw something like 15 million of COVID less uh, yes, yeah. or in all. Yes. Yeah. 15 million. That's right. That's the WHO's total. Uh, the official recorded deaths worldwide from COVID are 6 million. But WHO is saying uh, it's actually... Uh, about 15 million, and other groups have come up with similar numbers. Mm -hmm. And of that difference, 15 minus uh, 6 imported is 9 million. A big part of that, according to our research, was in India, the unrecorded deaths, or the missed deaths, if you want to call them from COVID, a large proportion of those, perhaps 3 million of those occurred in India itself. You know, one of the things that would occur to me is that so, most so often a person dies of several things at once, you know. Yeah. I mean, I have friends who uh, they died of COVID, but really um, they were in hospital already for, for surgery, which was just going well and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, is, there, is there a problem with ambiguity about what to really call it? I imagine not every death is clear cut. Yeah. Or is that a problem? That's a very good question. Uh, and if, in fact, the instruments that we have developed and used, which are called verbal autopsies, and they're exactly that. What they involve is a conversation between a field worker and a member of the household uh, where the dead person resided. And provided the, the person in doing the interview lived with the deceased, they're able to tell you a pretty good history of the symptoms that occurred along the way to death. And what we do is our system involves um, sending these teams out. So we've done it in India widely, and now that's the same system has expanded to Sierra Leone and Mozambique. Oh, your team um, is doing the same thing elsewhere now? That's right. Now it's expanded to several other countries, Mozambique, Ethiopia, uh, Sierra Leone in particular. But the basic premise is a really simple one. You f get a random sample of the population identified, like an opinion poll, and you send teams out to those homes to ask uh, some basic things. Who lives there? What are some of the risk factors? Do people smoke? Do they uh, drink? What are their blood pressures, for example? And then they ask, was there a death in the last whatever time period, in the last year, last two years, last three years. And if a death has occurred, then they ask, tell us what happened. And the family or the family member will describe in some detail the circumstances leading up to death. Mm -hmm. Now, what we do is we instruct all the staff saying, don't be in a rush to get a diagnosis. Listen. The most important magic of this whole effort is actually just listening to the household and writing down a half-page local language narrative. And then what happens is that's done now electronically, so it's on laptops. And then it's converted into electronic records, which we send to two physicians that are trained in how to analyze these data. And each physician has to agree on the cause of death. So if you and I were coding, if you said malaria and I said tuberculosis, mm -hmm. and what happens is we get each other's records anonymously. I, I won't know that it's you coding and you won't know uh, that it's me coding, you know, because I, I wouldn't want to have uh, one person defer to the other just based upon saying, oh, well, this is meta, I'd better not disagree. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, uh, but, and if the physicians continue to disagree, then a senior physician then comes in and adjudicates the, the cause of death. So with that system, what we're able to do is to get pretty good information, not perfect, on the major causes of death. And it's particularly good at uh, getting a diagnosis below the age of 70, 
Uh, at older ages, as you mentioned, people will have multiple morbidities and an unclear history. And, you know, for what it's worth, when uh, Queen Elizabeth's mother, uh, the, the Queen Mother died some years ago at the age of 101, the English death certificate, the official one said cause of death was of extreme old age. <laughs> So, yeah, now that's a problem at older ages where you have multiple conditions. But from the public health perspective, remember the challenge is reducing premature mortality. And the challenge in Africa and India still are deaths in younger adults and in children. So the system is actually aligned to the public health priorities. You're measuring avoidable deaths with far more certainty than you are the less avoidable deaths that occur in older age. Mm -hmm. Now, when you gave that talk, you, I, I think there was a reference to a million deaths. Yes. Surely you don't have a team of people actually going door to door to a million doors, uh, a million different uh -huh. deaths, yeah. or do you? The way it works is in, is in India, there's, uh, the, the census is done every 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the census then splits India into a million small areas. These are small villages or urban blocks. And we do the same in Canada. Prior to the census or after the census, you get small areas selected all over the country. That's where the census is, is done. Mm -hmm. So what the government does, the Indian government, is randomly select about 1% of these small areas, roughly 10,000 units out of the million. And then they have teams go to each of those areas every six months. And every six months, they are knocking at the door and asking, uh, tell us who's born, who's pregnant, who's died. Mm -hmm. And if a death occurs, then they do this verbal autopsy instrument. And, and it's the same happens, household each time. Same household, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how it works is they, they'll take a village, and sometimes in a village – people will move out, but they don't follow them, but others will move in. Sometimes a house, which has just got one uh, family, will split into two families. They, you know, let's say uh, the, the two sons both get married and they start their families, they split the house. Uh, so they follow this continuously. And what happens is the, the local staff or the local people are used to these people coming and asking them questions. And they're actually quite comfortable discussing even sensitive topics like deaths from suicide or from HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, in part because they've trusted these people saying, look, these folks are from the government and they're here as bean counters. They're not here to, um, to sell us something. They're not representing a pharmaceutical company. Uh, they're not giving us any treatments. They're here to listen. And in fact, what you find is many people find that experience of telling what happened to a loved one and describing the sad circumstances to be actually cathartic. I bet. It's you know, a great say, idea. You know, thanks for listening to me. And, mm -hmm. and we teach the, uh, the staff, all the field staff, to be really respectful and listen. And for what it's worth, I always say, if you want the best medical care, in Canada, go to a hospital where you've got medical students. And a well-trained medical student is taught what? When you interview a patient, listen. Just listen to their story. Tell, they'll tell you why they're there. Don't jump to a conclusion. Don't try to put words in their mouth. And we do the same kind of training for the field staff. Mm -hmm. and they build that rapport with uh, the population. And they trust them and they're able to tell them all sorts of uh, uh, sensitive details. And they write that down anonymously, of course. Everyone's individual ID is protected and, and never shared. Mm -hmm. And then we have our physicians um, that we've got uh, two on each record. So we treat the physicians like laboratory rats in that they have to uh, each go down a path of diagnosis and they have to agree and we keep a very tight ship on the physicians uh, but they're able to code these records very quickly so you can imagine field work is done on a monday the records are uploaded monday evening 
And then by Tuesday, some of the physicians can start to code on this. So within weeks, we'll actually have information on what's killing people. Uh, and now with the use of electronic data, meaning laptops and cell phones, which is now what we've done in, in Sierra Leone, this effort can actually work pretty reasonably real time. And in fact, in Sierra Leone, it was instrumental to study the fact that to everyone's surprise, there hasn't been a big surge of COVID deaths as had been feared. There's a small increase, but not a big, big increase as has occurred in Brazil or in Peru or in India. And now this is really paradoxical because we, what we also did is we studied the prevalence of infection by taking a random sample of people in one area of Bo, or, or in Bo district, which is part of Sierra Leone. And we tested for antibodies. Uh, you know, we tested the samples. They were brought over to Sinai Labs here in Toronto and had a very good high quality assay run uh, to look at antibodies. And, and let me ask you, Meta, just I'll throw this out to you. What do you think, how many, what percentage of Sierra Leone adults were infected, do you guess, from COVID? I think by now the majority of people in Canada have yeah. been, uh, have would have antibodies. That's right. So maybe the same, let's let's guess the same thing, 50% or? Uh, it was 90%. Hmm? It was 90% by last, uh, by 2021 uh, July, the Delta wave. No kidding. Yeah. So this has been the real paradox is you have in many parts of urban Africa, very, very high levels of infection, but reasonably low rates of hospitalizations and mortality. And well, this tell me about other. what the, the rate in Canada is. Now the rate in Canada, based upon our, we've also done an antibody study in Canada called the ABC study, the Action to Beat Coronavirus study. And in Canada, we're roughly up to about uh, between 60 to 70%, not including the current BA5 wave, which still is, we don't have evidence on, but we're roughly about 50 or 55% in Canada of adults being infected, at least. There's other estimates which are higher, but these are our own studies, which are, I think, the most robust ones. Well, in time, That's everybody's going to have it, right? Yeah. We, right? There's just no way of escaping it, right? Well, um, there are populations that have escaped it. But I think the interesting thing is, well, if you contrast India and, and Sierra Leone, they both had widespread transmission. And, you know, that occurs when you can think about it and houses there are constructed with multi-generations, right? So they'll have grandparents and parents and children living. So all it takes is one to get infected and it goes through the whole family. And that's what's happened in India and in Brazil and in Peru and certainly in, in Sierra Leone. So, but, and there's the same strain of virus, the Delta virus was seen in Africa and in, in, um, in uh, India, but the death rates in India were colossally high compared to Africa. Now, why is that? Well, we don't know. I don't know. Do you think they have a theory? Well, I think what we need to do is it's, it suggests we should urgently investigate what are the reasons why Africans, in urban Africa at least, seem to have lower death rates. Now, part of it might be their thinner, they have less diabetes and less chronic disease currently. Mm -hmm. So that might be a contribution. But even if you take that into account, there's startling differences. So then the question is, well, was there some earlier other, vac other infections that might have acted like a very lousy vaccine, but with mm -hmm. some effect that prevented the uh, large numbers of urban Africans from getting sick? Um, or is it the case, which I certainly hope it's not, that, well, in India, they also had many, many people infected in 2020. The surveys, the zero surveys at that time were showing um, perhaps 60, 70 percent of urban populations were infected. And this led to this 
overconfidence in India that, oh, well, we're okay. Look, you know, we got infected and nothing happened to us. Along comes the Delta wave in March, April of 2021, which was a colossal disaster. Mm -hmm. Millions of people died. You hear the stories of families just saying they just wouldn't go out of the house, but even then they still had people infected. They were running out of oxygen supplies. People were dying on the streets. I mean, it was a catastrophe for at least a, a, a month or two. Um, so why is that? Why did that occur in India, but not in, in Africa? My, my fear, which I hope certainly won't come through, is that combination killer wave, the type of virus that basically works really uh, efficiently at killing people, has not yet hit Africa. And um, if that occurs, that would be an absolute disaster. But uh, we, we all think that, oh, okay. COVID is kind of over, but it's not. And we need to have ongoing studies, both of mortality, but also of infection to really understand what's happening. And we need to have a global lens from this. Mm -hmm. uh, the sense that, well, we're doing okay in Canada. Well, if a new variant breaks out in Africa because of uncontrolled transmission, there's no way it would not come into Canada. The border restrictions, all of those are pretty useless. Mm -hmm. By the time you discover a new variant, you can almost be sure it's in our backyard. That's what happened with all. I have heard there's some people who just plain don't get sick from it or, yeah. or something. Now, could it be that, I mean, what about blacks in other countries? So is blacks, Canadian, uh, uh, you know, black people are, yeah. is there, uh, I, as far as I've heard, th they are probably in worse shape in terms of... That's right. And in the U.S., the, there's higher death rates in the U.S. Uh, and higher cases rates in, in Canada among um, Black Africans or uh, or, uh, or African Americans or African Canadians. Uh, so whatever it is, is, uh, is not a protective factor um, that... Uh, basically is related to, to race. There must be other determinants, other infections, environmental stimuli that we need to investigate. So, But I think this comes back to the more general point that if, if we are concerned about pandemics, and everyone is, and future pandemics, you can never build a system to monitor pandemics after the pandemic starts. You need to have this in place before. And this is the value of something like the Million Death Study or the Sierra Leone equivalent, is what they do is they're sampling random parts of the population on an ongoing basis. Every year, there's an ongoing survey. And then you've got then the basis to say, okay, if something bad hits, you can go back and ask, okay, well, were there a lot of COVID deaths? Uh, were there unusual deaths from other causes that might have been a new infection? So, uh, the, you know, you, you don't build a fire station after a fire starts. You need to have good monitoring and smoke detectors and the whole, uh, the whole system in place. Mm -hmm. um, and you this know, one is of the, uh, uh, our board of directors is Dr. Ronald St. John, mm -hmm. who was the head of the, uh, uh, I guess, Canadian Public Health during SARS, but uh, uh, he, he uh, was, I guess, very involved with this creation of GFIN, the Global Public Health something. I I don't remember what you call it, what it's an acronym for, but it is um, a, a monitoring. Early on, they were they were monitoring uh, reports in the press. Um, that they would get from the internet in the very earliest days of the internet, yeah. people um, uh, reporting that a new disease had cropped up in a particular place and they could spot it quicker than mm -hmm. the WHO. Yeah. Um, now, I, there's been a bit of a scandal, as I recall, uh, reading in the Globe and Mail about the fact that the Canadian uh, bureaucrats uh, closed this thing down when it should have been, uh, you know, when it was extremely valuable, not just to Canada, but people globally. Um, would, would it, what you're suggesting sounds like a, um, an expanded version, 
of uh, something like that where you would actually try to monitor the whole world uh, very, not necessarily just by, um, uh, you know, internet monitoring, but by people actually going door to door and, and, and checking as your team does. Mm -hmm. Is that what you think would be useful? Well, it is, it's somewhat like that and it's not. And uh, first of all, I think we have to realize that the, in a global world with rapid air travel that's increasing still, it's just impossible to think of this idea that we'll be able to wall off a, a country or wall off uh, the next pandemic. It just won't work. Um, so what that suggests is what we need are data systems all over the world that are able to not just protect Canadians, but actually help inform their own population on the routine killers. So you build systems to monitor the routine that can deal with the dramatic. And I'll just give you some numbers to put this in context. In the 20th century as a whole, you know, we probably had 100 million deaths from pandemic flu. That's perhaps the 1918-19 pandemic killed anywhere between 60 to 120 million. In what period of time again? 1918-19 pandemic flu. A hundred, okay. So there was about a hundred, and then if you add on the other influenza um, epidemics that occurred in 1957 and so forth, then roughly a hundred million is a reasonable number that died from pandemic flu. 200 million died in wars and famine uh, during the 20th century. These So these are man-made disasters, very much man-made, driven by men uh, going to war or causing um, political strife. So those are pretty big numbers. But in the 20th century, 2 billion children died from routine causes. So if you look at all of the births and uh, and deaths, and that's where progress we've, uh, the, that's where the major progress has been made is because we took the leading causes of death, in this case, uh, childhood uh, uh, deaths, and we took that seriously. The world now has got substantial reductions in child mortality. So you have to have these systems, these data efforts, not just focus on, okay, I want to know what's happening tomorrow and it's internet-based. They have to work in countries and produce data that helps the domestic priorities but also is a global warning system. And are we there yet in terms of the global architecture? No, uh, Canada vastly underinvests in global data, mm -hmm. and supporting global data systems. And um, yet, if as COVID has taught us, that's really short-sighted. You could think about the world, let's say high-income countries putting in $20 billion to strengthen data systems in Africa, Asia, uh, parts of East Asia that are poor, um, you know, basically where, where help is needed. And so 20 billion sounds like a big, big amount of money, but compare that to the economic loss from COVID by some accounts has been $4 trillion or $5 trillion at least. So we, you know, we we have to have our scale right, and it's an argument, quite frankly, for taxpayers like you and I, having some of our money go into global uh, systems that basically are there to help Sierra Leone and Kenya and Ethiopia and India and Bangladesh, mm -hmm. but also provide data openly and globally so that it protects the whole world. It just, it makes what, sense. What, what were the main causes of death in children uh, when you had 2 billion deaths at a time? Well, they're the same, uh, more or less, as what's happening in high mortality environments like in Sierra Leone. So in Sierra Leone, still about roughly 10% of children born will die before their fifth birthday. It's among the highest in, in the world. And the leading causes of death are malaria, pneumonia, diarrhea, and other infections, infectious diseases. Mm. And that's been the case right throughout history. Uh, you had these routine causes and uh, that were the dominant. But along 
the way what happened is you'd get peaks of particular infection. So smallpox, for example, would come in waves. Mm -hmm. And smallpox used to kill about 3 million, mostly children, a year. But it's been eliminated because of the worldwide smallpox eradication. Um, diarrhea used to kill about 7 million deaths or 7 million children a year, but that's now down to less than uh, a few hundred thousand because of use of oral rehydration and of vaccines. Diarrhea is mostly controlled uh, through a, a few things. There's very effective vaccines like the rotavirus vaccines, but oral rehydration therapy developed in Bangladesh, which basically takes uh, uh, some fluids, some sterile water, and you have some uh, bicarbonates, and you have salt and sugar, and those ingredients given into a kid um, will mean the difference between life and death. And that's been one of the key things that's had a remarkable impact. Mm -hmm. um, malaria control uh, outside of Africa has been spectacularly success, and now their successes within Africa. Uh, the number of children dying from malaria, thankfully, is going down because of prompt detection and treatment and use of, of mos mosquito nets that uh, uh, that are sprayed with insecticides that ward off uh, the, the uh, killer mosquitoes. So all of these things in combination have led to a remarkable improvement in child mortality. Um, and going forward, we now have a challenge saying, well, it's not just kids. We have to focus on adults and adult mortality. And adult mortality is caused by many, many different things. And to understand many different things, you need to know or have a system like the Million Death Study. If, if you can get to what Canada has, which is almost all of the deaths occur in institutions, then you can have a, a system where doctors fill out death certificates but in many parts of the world, that's decades away. And mm -hmm. since it's decades away, the best system to invest in is this random sample of deaths in many populations that uh, are monitored for, uh, for deaths. And in the modern era, you can set up a structure uh, and agreements that these data aren't just buried in government reports. They actually are openly available. They're up on the cloud. They're on the web pretty quickly. And then they're accessed. So we've done that in with the, in, with the government of Sierra Leone. All of the Sierra Leone data are up on a server that anyone can access. You can go on today and you know get the Sierra Leone data. Um, hmm. And we're encouraging the Indian government to do the same. We're going to be releasing all the million death study data into the public realm uh, very soon. So that encourages more people to use and it increases accountability. Um, and that's the kind of global thinking we need to really think about how do we detect and respond to pandemics. Mm -hmm. you know, responding to pandemics can't be knee-jerk reactions. You have to anticipate them in advance mm -hmm. and be able to respond um, in advance. You know, Project Save the World has six global threats, and uh, some of them are, you know, war and weapons, of course, global warming, famine, pandemics, uh, radioactive exposure, and uh, and cyber risks. Uh, but all of them are, except for the pandemics, all of them uh, have some version, well, I, I would also accept for cyber. Uh, all of them have a kind of social movement attached to it so that there are people uh, who are just activists working on these issues so that it's a public concern you can go to a, mm -hmm. a you know a meeting a, 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 of other people who are worried about a, a, a such an issue or you can work on hunger a, as a club or something but uh, public health is a profession and there's there's no room that I can think of for bringing activists into into any particularly important role yes. in in working on um, on pandemics. Um, what is can you see a role for ordinary citizens who might you know think well I didn't like this COVID thing let's see if I can pitch in and try to uh, work on prevention. Yeah. 
Well, I think it uh, uh, it takes quite an enlightened citizen to make those connections that the single best way to protect Canadians going forward would be to have good information systems in Africa that can pick up the next variation of the virus that might go global. Mm -hmm. um, it takes, uh, you know, when if it's partly just people can't kind of get their heads around it. If you were living in an apartment oh. building, then obviously you would say, hey, if everyone in the apartment building has a smoke detector and a sprinkler, then I'm going to be safe if there's a fire even three floors below me. People get that idea. But translating that saying, okay, it's the same in global health, that if countries far away have good systems to be able to pick up something before it gets really bad, uh, or know that they're actually controlling a disease, then that's going to uh, very much protect me. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some other parts of that as well. I would say one of the other hidden threats is antimicrobial resistance. So the fact that uh, uh, drugs are so commonly used, particularly in, in, uh, in agriculture, um, and antibiotics are commonly used, is leading to resistance of, of the bugs against the common antibiotics. And that's going to spread around the world. Uh, there's no way you can confine that in just one area. It just it will spread around the world. Mm -hmm. So it it takes enlightened citizenry to say, okay, there are obviously the dramatic things we know and we see the effects and the concerns about immediate nuclear war, which is a legitimate one, or of um, catastrophic uh, events from climate change induced uh, hurricanes and others. But it also says, well, let's pay attention to the whole spectrum. And the whole spectrum does mean paying attention to public health and the data that are needed to drive public health. Um, and, you know, if, we, if you did a historic study of how health improved in Canada and the US, a big part of it was driven by data. It was simply the observations of what was happening in different populations. Mm -hmm. And the most classic example is one of smoking. So you think, well, um, lung cancer was actually quite a rare disease in the uh, prior to the 19th century. Even among pipe smokers, there wasn't a huge increase in lung cancer. So what happened is, well, in the early um, uh, early 20th century, there was this colossal increase in lung cancer being recorded in the US, in Canada, and in the UK. And the, at that time, the Medical Research Council in the UK and others were puzzled, thinking, well, what, what's going on? In fact, there's a famous story where they sent two famous epidemiological teams, uh, you know, a bit like that, uh, that CSI type uh, scenario, they sent teams out. Yeah. One was uh, Bradford Hill and Richard Dahl, and the other was Jeffrey Rose and Archie Cochran. And almost as a flip of a coin, they said, well, Dahl and Hill, why don't you look into smoking? And, um, and Rose and, uh, and uh, uh, Cochran, why don't you look at exhaust fumes from cars? And they said, just get on with it. And they both the both teams came up with the same kind of design, what's called a case control study design. And of course, there was no association with car fumes, uh, but there was a huge association found with smoking. And you know, why were they looking at this? Well, because it was men getting lung cancer. And so they thought, well, men are the ones that are out. Maybe it's the exhaust fumes from cars because that had increased. So that it, it started with this observation, the colossal increase in lung cancer that was a, previously a rare disease spurred this action and then led to the identification of smoking as a key risk factor. And as a result of the efforts around smoking, by some estimate, maybe 10, 15 million lives have been saved just from the awareness raised mm -hmm. about the hazards of smoking. 
Um, and then you have more contemporary examples. Um, AIDS was discovered. Um, oh, well, there was these reports coming out of San Francisco in the early 1980s of weird, unusual cancers occurring in young men. I was reporting the New England Journal and the CDC report saying, you know, we've got something weird going on. We've got unusual uh, infective type cancers uh, like Kaposi's sarcoma occurring in young, otherwise healthy men. And that led to the alarm that said, well, there must be an underlying infection that's driving this. And that led to the identification of the HIV virus. And very quickly, that it wasn't just in San Francisco, it was all over the world. And that heralded the, the start of the, uh, um, the HIV pandemic. So these systems that have been in place have substantially improved health in, in Canada. Uh, I'll give you one more example, that the, uh, which is a good news story, that breast cancer mortality in women, if, if you don't smoke as a woman, your leading cause of, of, uh, of death or risk is breast cancer. Oh. And if, but what was happening is breast cancer mortality was actually going up uh, right through the early, uh, roughly 1990s or late 80s. And then when researchers started identifying that a combination of uh, simple treatments, it wasn't prevention, they weren't preventing breast cancer, but they were finding ways to combine hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery. So these small, small additions together have led to a substantial halving of breast cancer mortality in Canada and the US and the UK. I didn't know that. That's yeah, and that's, we're able to- well, How come I don't know that? Because that's interesting that yeah. a person who's normal wouldn't have even heard such a thing. Well, uh, you see these, uh, the, this, if you look at the statistics, they're up on the Canadian uh, yeah. uh, the WHO or other data sets, the reduction in breast cancer mortality tells you that the things that are being done in the clinical care are actually working. So that's a reassurance. Like we saw where we're putting all of these efforts in, but the lung cancer mm -hmm. or the, uh, the breast cancer mortality is not going down, then that would be of concern, but they are. Mm -hmm. So all of these come from just the routine systems of counting the dead and describing causes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we benefited from them extraordinarily in our high income country. And so the argument is, well, Absolutely, they're needed as a global investment. Uh, you know, think about it that you're in a building and everyone has an incentive to say, we're going to pay for uh, smoke alarms and, uh, and uh, sprinkler systems for the whole building. It comes out of my rent or my, uh, my condo fees or whatever is the equivalent. Uh, and we should be thinking the same way on a crowded, uh, crowded planet uh, with very close neighbors. Uh, it's, well, it's, clearly it's, that is an area where there is there needs to be a change in public mentality. Social movements often uh, can contribute to changing perspectives on things. Yeah. And then the benefits of, uh, of that knowledge um, are global. Like if uh, I hope with some further investigation, if we're able to get some sense of what was the reasons behind the high levels of infection, but low mortality rates in urban Africa, that can point the way to either treatments or a new vaccine that is relevant worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, all of these, I mean, Louis Pasteur said it uh, first that, you know, uh, science belongs to no country because it belongs to humanity. And that's very much the case. So we, we these investments aren't just altruistic. They're actually in our own economic and parochial interest to say if you want a, a safer, healthier world. I know that you did a, a lot of work on tobacco, which yep. the first time I came across your name in connection with that, I thought tobacco as an epidemic. Well, yes, I guess it is an epidemic is. Uh, that I hadn't, I hadn't uh, thought of it as an epidemic, but to what extent has that succeeded? How, how many people nowadays still smoke? Yeah. And we, have uh, a, 
We have two stories. One is a remarkable progress in high-income countries. So in, in Canada, the smoking attributable deaths um, have fallen by almost half in, in middle age. And if you look at the deaths in middle age due to smoking, uh, in fact, what's happened is they've been halved twice. It used to be for Canadian men in 1970s, about 14% of middle-aged men aged 35 to 69 would be killed by smoking. And then that was halved to about 8%. Say that again, 45% of men... 14%. 14%, 14 of men, uh, middle-aged men were killed by smoking. Yeah. Okay. And uh, remember, in middle age at that time, the overall risk of death was about 40%. So smoking was counting for about a third of all the deaths. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happened is the reductions in smoking in Canada have been so substantial that that smoking risk has been halved twice. It went from roughly 14% to about uh, roughly 8% and then was halved again from 8% to 4%. So we've had a two-thirds reduction in smoking attributable mortality in Canada in, in men. Women are lagging behind because they took up smoking later, uh, but now the peak has been reached in women. So Really? Now, wait a minute. This is interesting. Women yeah. are still are smoking more than men? No, women started smoking later than men. Yeah, so but they, they never smoked it. The rate of smoking wasn't as high for women, was it? Eventually it was, yes. Okay. Eventually the number of cigarettes and uh, the amount smoked for women was the same as men. Is that right? But because they started roughly 20 years later, the mortality effects are going to be seen 20 years later. Oh. But we've documented that recently in a, in a New England Journal paper. We compared uh, women who basically smoked like men uh, but started about, uh, they were born around um, World War II or shortly thereafter, whereas the men who smoked seriously were born before World War II. And if you then say, all right, if you study the women that smoked like men, they die like men, and their risks of smoking now are, are comparable uh, to men. Now, what, what parts of the world are still smoking the most? Well, the, the, the good news is that we've had big increases in quitting and decreased uptake in, in, uh, in Canada. But still, we've got about three to four million smokers in Canada, and uh, that's still a very large number. Um, and they face very high risks uh, versus non-smokers. But the main concern is in places in, like in China, India, Indonesia, and uh, including Russia, in those places, the rates of smoking haven't uh, either they've not come down or they've actually gone up or they've come down only modestly. And what's happening is, if, you know, this adage is if you want to kill yourself from smoking, start early and don't quit. And it takes decades of smoking seriously to be able to get uh, serious disease. Hmm. Uh, and that's what's now hop happening to the younger smokers in China and India. They're now getting into the older ages or middle ages where they've smoked long enough that they're developing quite high rates of heart disease and stroke and tuberculosis uh, and cancers. Are, are any of the younger ones quitting? Or uh, what, what is happening is, uh, thankfully worldwide, the younger cohorts seem to have less uptake but still, still uh, tens of millions of uh, young smokers take up uh, uh, cigarettes every year. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, by some estimates, it might be close to 100 million, but uh, still tens of millions uh, take it up. So that still means, and you know, the simple way to think about this is, if you're a typical smoker that starts early and doesn't quit, the smoking will kill you one in two, roughly um, you know, it's it's not rolling the dice, it's flipping a coin that smoking will cause um, about half of the deaths in long-term smokers uh, because of the smoking and terminal diseases. So that means some people get away with it, but um, half don't. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the amount of life lost, well, some people don't die, but some people die from smoking quite early. 
And if you average it, then a typical smoker loses about a decade of life lost versus a typical non-smoker. And mm -hmm. that's now been seen in many populations. I think most people, if you talk to them, would say, I don't want to throw away a decade of sometimes good life. And the good news for them, however, is that the newer evidence suggests that quitting smoking is ridiculously effective. If you quit smoking, ideally by age 40 or even earlier, uh, ideally, you avoid nearly 90% of the risk of continued smoking. So basically, you get back all of those, almost all of those 10 years of lost life. And even if you quit by age uh, 60, you get back about uh, four or five years of those. You don't get it all back, but you get a good chunk, uh, good chunk back. So what are the popular uh, diseases among uh, young people now? I've, I've heard that there's just a huge increase in suicides among young, young people. It varies by setting. Yeah, it does vary by setting. Um, oh, okay. In, in North America, the suicide patterns tend to be one that basically increases with age. Um, so the highest suicide rates are at older ages. Um, mm. But in China and in India, exactly as you say, the there's very high suicide rates in young adults and a lot of it is related around social and family circumstances, uh, entering the workforce or entering marriage or social circumstances. And there's huge differences within India. There's a 20-fold gradient in suicide death rates between South India and North India for reasons we don't fully understand. Also within South China and North China. Which way? Which uh, North India? Much higher in the South in both settings. Really? Yeah. So there's inside uh, in South India, really. That's also in South India. So, and that was shown in the million death study it had very high rates of suicide in the South. Um, and you see uh, uh, in India, you see in men a, a two peak, you see one peak in younger adults, you know, roughly 15 to 30. And then you see another one a little older, which might be related to, for example, farmer suicides and work pressures. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very different pattern, uh, and it, it varies by country. Yeah, I've heard yeah. about the farmer's suicides. Yeah. It's clearly an economic uh, problem. Tell, tell me, you know, when, when you talked about um, uh, your million death study in the, uh, the Science for Peace meeting, you, you, uh, there were two things that, that I came away with that had surprised me. One was the number of people who died of snake bites. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I wonder, you know, can, can you elaborate on that? How, how widespread is that? Is that just India or is that where in the world no. is that a real problem? Well, we, uh, in the first round of the million death study, we found a surprise that the estimates of how many Indians were killed by snake bite was 50,000. And that was the world health organizations worldwide total, including Africa and other settings. So obviously that can't be right. If it's 50,000 in India alone, then the worldwide totals must be much higher. Mm -hmm. And to their credit, what the World Health Organization has done is updated their estimates now to about 100,000. But more importantly, they have put snake bites on the list of neglected tropical diseases and now there's a global strategy that says by 2030, they want to have the rates of snake bite deaths. We did a further study published uh, uh, last year or in 2019 that looked at the 20 year trajectory of snake bite deaths in India and roughly said if you have 50,000 deaths a year over 20 years, it's been stable. There's close to a million snake bites uh, deaths in that time period. And then we were able to isolate which areas of the country this occurs in. And in particular, it's in populations that are in rural areas and populations that um, are uh, not taking suitable precautions. And there's some really simple stuff that you can do. Ram Whitker, one of uh, our collaborators, uh, lives in southern India and he's been arguing for years on what can be done to counter snake bites. So one's a very simple one. You align where the snake venom, the anti-snake venom is available in India. It needs to be updated to the species 
But if you had that basically stocked on the shelves of the places where these deaths occur, you could prevent uh, prevent a death. So some of these deaths take several hours and you, you'd yeah. have time to go to the drugstore and get something. Yeah, that's so, right. I, 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 but you have to have a specific anti-venom for each, uh, each uh, species. Is that no, right? They're, what they've got now is a blended anti-venom that kind of looks at the most common uh, common species. So uh, ideally, if you can identify the the snake that uh, that bit you, then you'll get a more custom treatment. But they blend these antivenoms and you're covering various species. So, I mean, that's an effective strategy. Strategies to do some simple education, saying that at night, um, particularly farmers that are working, shouldn't go out without a, a, a torch. Now they can use their cell phones because that... Uh, snakes bite in the dark but you know mm. if there's light on them they're less likely to to bite you so these simple things could be done to reduce snake bite deaths um, mm -hmm. and um you know i think one of the things we've been able to add value and i'm quite proud to do so is we've created a snake bite map as to where the these uh bites occur over a roughly a 20-year period and then that uh should mean you put the available anti-venom into the health centers in those areas because mm -hmm. that's where the bites are occurring. It's parts of Andhra Pradesh and so forth. And you, you, you get so much in Delhi. Uh, I presume they have to be in refrigerators and somebody needs to, to take, take care of the stuff. Some of them are uh, heat stable, so you can actually keep them um, at room temperature for a while, but otherwise they're just in a basic fridge. They're mm -hmm. not like uh, you know, the RNA viruses would have to be at minus 70 for COVID. They're, uh, they're pretty stable and pretty durable. Um, let, one last question, and that is I've, I've referred to one of the things that you reported uh, when I, because oftentimes in uh, these talk shows, this topic comes up about eating meat. And you had uh, your a million uh, deaths study had uh, looked at the um, the death rate from uh, of b between vegetarians and non-vegetarians, and uh, you said that the women um, it'd be you'd be safer eating meat. <laughs> but I think at that time you said you thought it was because the culture meant that the women served the rest of the family first and only got to eat the leftovers, so they probably didn't get enough protein. No. Is that uh, well, that we we do find that lacto vegetarians and in India they're lifelong lacto vegetarians have a higher cardiac mortality than non lacto vegetarians. Um, Wait a minute, what's a lacto vegetarian? It means they'll eat uh, milk and yogurt. They won't eat eggs. I mean, there's some over lacto vegetarians, meaning they'll also eat eggs, but mostly it's they'll meet, eat uh, milk. And, uh, and dairy products, but they won't eat eggs or meat. And this but is true for both males and females. It's true for both that, uh, that lacto-vegetarian isn't protective against heart disease and might actually increase the risks in India. Uh, we see that pretty clearly. And I think the mechanism is very much, as you've said, that if um, you have populations that have more reliance on carbohydrate-based diets than protein-based diets, then that's going to uh, uh, potentially have an impact on uh, cardiac risk. Um, but we're, we're still working on trying to get that story uh, sorted out, but there is uh, clearly a, an excess uh, in lacto-vegetarians of cardiac mortality. Thank you so much for this. It's absolutely You're fascinating. Welcome. Okay, really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks, Meta. Okay, bye. Project Save the World produces two of these shows each week. This is episode 505. Watch or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website to save the world.ca. People share information there about six global issues. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can subscribe for $20 Canadian per year. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar, enter the word peace. 
you'll find buttons to click to subscribe.